I'm Michael Zargum. I am the founder of Block Science. It's a private research company based out of the US. Um, I've worked on socio-technical systems, cyber-physical systems, large-scale optimization, and the like for 15 plus years. Uh, my PhD was in decentralized optimization. And then I kind of got into blockchain stuff a few years ago, three or four now. And one of the things that I find really exciting is the sort of boundary between the sort of social and economic and the sort of physical and technical. And since tonight's discussions are aimed to be around data and art, I decided to sort of grab a few slides. I talked to Beth and I decided to focus a bit on the sort of subjectivity um, associated with these systems. And for that, I'd like to start with this slide. Um, I usually use it in the context of engineering when I talk about the things that we build, actually reshaping the world that we live in, that we in turn adapt to them. This is common in the discussion of incentives and the various things that people do with token system designs, but also the things that we do to sort of reshape the, the things we're even able to do. So a, you know, a peer to peer system can actually allow you to transact with each other in a way that you know prior to its existence was just not available to you, which is a separate step from actually being incentivized to do it and that in fact changes our behavior explicitly it's a bit like the digital equivalent of building a new road like you simply couldn't drive over say a bridge across the river and now you can traffic patterns change maybe we put a toll on it and that changes the incentives but we don't have to think about these systems necessarily from a everything's all new all the time and I think in particular when we talk about art I think things actually have changed less in some way, because the underlying sort of value is um, very similar, and that what we're gonna talk about today mostly is the way that these systems are actually um, bridging the, the social and all the way to the physical. So this slide I use frequently to talk about the layers required to kind of adjust the way that the system works. In the blockchain Web3 world, our lowest level is this sort of trusted data. We get computation that's got, you know, basically cryptographic enforcements, guarantees that tell us that what we thought would happen when we computed in fact happened. But then as you get higher up, you provide these interaction patterns, potentially smart contracts, or things that allow us to interact in a certain way, a bit like our bridge. It's a new pattern of behavior that's available. Then we sort of get to the actual use of that pattern, the behaviors themselves. And then we see the actual emergent phenomena, the ones that we think about, the traffic example, it's the, it's the traffic itself, the, the crowded you know, toll on Monday morning. So we can actually start to think about things across the, the, the social, economic, technological, and physical. And when we start talking about things like NFTs in the context of art, representations of physical things that have data representing potentially their history, potentially their authorship, who participated in its creation, or maybe if it's music, I'm sampling something and I'm able to produce a sort of lineage of the things that were actually inside of it. So I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about something called an attribution network, um, and I guess I will sort of jump ahead. Um, yeah, I'll hop through this, I'll come back to it. So an attribution network is essentially the um, the provenance of a piece of, of, of data or a provenance of the contributions, the, the data about the things that people did to create something. And so these are actually from a project called SourceCred that's working with initially um, tracking the contributions to build open source software, sort of expanded to include forum posts and other sort of non-technical contributions and to sort of see what actually went into creating a sort of collaborative output and retain the sort of history of that work over time relative to different dimensions of value. As part of the process of creating this thing, some very subjective decisions were made. The creator had to actually describe some values, some functional metadata of the contributions. Am I, is it code? Is it a post? Is it something that's been tagged with the 
you know, let's see here, we've got artwork, communication, logistics, AI expertise. So there was a project at a hackathon and all of the contributions were tagged with metadata at the time that they were contributed. And that actually affected the way that you could look at this attribution network. You could ask, hey, show me everything that was related to artwork or show me the sort of ranking of the contributions relative to artwork as the source and and this is important it's a bit like a page rank algorithm where you can actually pick a node in the graph and ask how the different individuals or the d different contributions actually relate it to that um, to that keyword or that metadata. And so what you're starting to do is create a high dimensional data model that represents a creative process over time across multiple people and that this is actually fundamental to the way that um, we value the things that we create because creating an art is inherently social. You actually care about who made it. You care about who they sampled. You care about who they were influenced by. And in fact, some of this work had some um, lineage in the bibliometrics, which is essentially the study of um, citations and academic work, where you again see people citing things and building on each other's creations and creating a network or a history of how that creation came to be, giving sort of you know, credence to those who came before you. So when you stand on the shoulders of giants, either academically or artistically, that that's not actually lost and in fact can become explicit. But I will note that it is actually still subjective. So this thing, it's a pretty high dimensional data set, the, the rules, the metadata, the things you can contribute, what counts as a contribution, who has the right to contribute, et cetera. These are actually subjective choices by the designer of these systems. And so we actually can't ignore their effects on the processes themselves. So in, in a broader sense, this is where conversations about governance, of, of data governance, of community governance, et cetera, come in because whenever you have a technologically mediated community, then that technology is serving sort of part of the nervous system of that community, and it in turn has a big impact. If you don't have something that can capture, say, logistics, and in my example, this was quite important because we worked at a hackathon, um, there was a person who wasn't present at the hackathon that coordinated the logistics for over half the team. And so they ended up appearing in this chart despite the fact that they weren't present because several people wouldn't have even been there. But it started with the subject choice to include that logistical effort in this view of the world when it could have just as easily been neglected for the person's absence. So we kind of start to think about these systems in their social dimensions as the primary focus. And then we start to ask what the high dimensional representations underneath are the sort of substrate or the, the sort of real digital world, the, the reality that we construct when we create digital systems in which we capture facts about what's transpired, you know, economically what's transpired, um, sort of the, the history of the events is limited to the sensors or the observations that you capture. Um, so the inclusion of exclusion of dimensions matters a lot. And in particular, you get some pretty interesting phenomena when you actually start putting things like this into practice. This is a, a map of what we would call a network formation game. The idea here is that the network is this graph of contributions and people. And that over time, that network is formed as new people join the community and contribute things. And it becomes a web of people and contributions. But what's interesting is because the rules about what it means to contribute are actually mutable by the curators or maintainers of the system, we end up with this sort of game between contributions and sort of maintenance of what it means to contribute. And in the design of this particular system, the goal is actually to make this a a nice balance of power where it's not like the maintainers or curators are forcing anyone to do anything in particular, but they are defining what this community considers value. And then in return, you'd expect people's contributions to be things that the community considers valuable. And if those things start to fall out of alignment with the needs of that community, then it's sort of beholden to the 
curators or the maintainers to make adjustments to that. But if they change it too fast or shock the system in a way that people don't like, they're, they're likely to simply leave this community or in a sort of open source framework, maybe just fork it and sort of start managing their own version of the same thing. And so we can imagine that uh, these systems are going to be potentially a dominant form of um, observability and co-creation as they sort of migrate beyond the open source community towards other forms of collective creation. And um, in particular, there was a project at the Diffusion Hackathon a few weeks ago that actually won the token engineering track called Trojan DAO, and that's actually an art DAO. So it's a, a community doing funding for art, basically art-based projects. So they have people come looking for funding, and those projects are funded out of a a raise that's dedicated to that artistic um, sort of, I don't know the specifics of what they funded. I think they only recently launched their smart contracts. But um, it's a pretty interesting phenomenon to see the, um, the actual beginnings of using these digital um, tools to actually become community nervous systems or tools for deciding together what constitutes value. So um, I'm going to give it maybe three minutes of slightly more technical points. So when we get into actually building attribution networks, these things can actually be constructed in content addressable DHTs. So things like the file storage that Marcus talked about earlier, where actually if you embed references to things inside of things, you can make trees. And these trees can represent the sort of attribution history. And in fact, you can't cheat these things, they're they are permanent. You could potentially attribute them later and say, hey, this thing, I add a new link onto it and say, hey, for some reason, you know, I don't like this or I didn't think this was cool, but that thing is still there and any attributions that it had are still there. And so we can have a sort of underlying multi-dimensional sort of value substrate. But the important thing about this is it can and should be too high dimensional to be the thing that we think about. We want it to capture as much of the value creation history as possible, and then the subjective measures that sit on top of it, their reductions, their, their metrics. And if a, one metric is not working for us, we can change the metric without changing the substrate. And this is important because we want to build systems where the cost to change things that need to be changed isn't too high, but at the same time, the like infrastructure or the underlying capabilities are sort of general enough that we don't need to change them. And so I will end on a simple mocked example of a you know, co-authorship graph. So here I have a bunch of made up children's books and some authors and some hashes relative, you know, made up hashes for these objects. And what it does is actually provide a data set which is representative of this tree. And the tree has an edge in it if the book cites another book, and it has an edge in it if a person was an author of that book, and you get a sort of um, graph structure here. And you can imagine these can be extremely high dimensional from authors to citations to influences to maybe, you know, you get to the point where you can put what song you were listening to when you had the idea for the book. Like the, the openness of this underlying thing is actually quite general. And so we're moving towards a world where we can collect massive amounts of data and we can embed that collection in the sort of everyday activity. But the sort of end on that is back to how we manage who gets to access what when. And I'm gonna leave that one since it's a whole can of worms in its own right. But um, I think there's also a lot that Ocean Guys can say about um, using tokens and data orchestration to control access rights and to make sure that if you are storing large amounts of data, that actually those data are put to the uses they're intended for and not simply made available for the manipulation and abuse by other parties. So I will leave it at that.